Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey LeBenger. At Summit Medical Group, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important healthcare issues that affect their lives. That's why we're very proud to support important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Atlantic Health System, building healthier communities, NJM Insurance Group, Summit Medical Group, a multi-specialty medical practice providing comprehensive care from birth and pediatrics to geriatric care, concentrating in general wellness, cancer treatment, disease management, and behavioral health. New Jersey Resources, PNC Bank. And by Suez, water solutions to meet tomorrow's environmental challenges. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. You know, I was uh, looking forward to this show, but now I'm not anymore. You looked, you looked good with some of those older clips. Just Can I introduce the guy on camera right now who thinks he's got a good sense of humor? Matt Cer Servito, I just, just met a few minutes ago. We're just going to sit here and bust each other, right? Let me ask you something. Okay. Do you yeah. think because we happen to be Italian-American from a certain part of the country mm -hmm. with a certain kind of personality that you can just say anything on my show? You can offend me and say I look younger in those clips? I'm sorry, is this, is this going to be edited out? Are we, how does this work? No, no, we're on the air. Where's my teleprompter? No, there is no <laughs> teleprompter. First of all, Matt, I, can I give him some credits here before we run another clip? Uh, on The Sopranos, he, in fact, played uh, Special Agent Dwight Harris. Mm -hmm. What a great role. On Billions, one of my favorite show, you are Bob Sweeney. Buffalo Bob Sweeney. From upstate New York, From involved in politics a little bit. Yes, the mayor of Buffalo at the moment on the show. Okay, this is going to be seen later. Um, yeah. Let me also say that Matt told me what was going to happen in the series. Now I don't have to watch anymore. So, um, it's because I had to explain the show to you. It was kind of like, you know, subtitled for Stop you. Stop it. Uh, right. What's the other one? Oh, yeah. On your, uh, we're about to show you play Satan yeah. on the Adult Swim television series. Your pretty face is going to hell, fourth season? Yeah. Describe that. Uh, it's a workplace comedy set in hell. Um, that is uh, in its fourth season. We basically, everybody, everybody works for Satan. Um, I, it's kind of... Look, the show looks like the Muppets on acid, um, and it's touched by an angel in reverse. Basically, Satan sends them up to Earth to do bad things, and they do those bad things very badly and come back and tell me how bad they did at it. Um, but uh, as opposed to touched by an angel where he sends them down, they do good things, and they go back to heaven. Um, but it really is uh, the office meeting a Bosch painting. It just kind of looks insane. You're uh, not our demo, because our demo's probably 15 to 25. No guy's over six. You think the show's actually going to air? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> believe, believe me. I know this is, this is all just getting me away from my wife and kids for half an hour. Thank you. Hey, speaking of your kids, yes. can I make a mention? Make Go mention? ahead, please. So you got a little extra makeup done today. I did. Lauren did an amazing job. Uh, I came in here looking like Jerry Cooney, and she has kind of fixed <laughs> me up to look like a claymation figure, uh, but yeah, they're this, I gotta go over here. Did you get in a the fight? Stitch, stitches. Um, the good news is, Steve, that my son's fastball is jumping at about 60 miles an hour, he's 12 years old. Wow. Uh, the bad news is I found that out by taking it to the face. I was sort of a radar gun for his fastball. Um, and there was a lot of blood and stitches, and it was just my slow reaction. That's all it was, I did not catch the ball fast enough. Can we run the clip from your pretty face, it's going to hell, can we run the clip? Let's go. Sure, you've all heard the rumors by now about the possible layoffs. They're not true. Here's the problem. Souls are way down, all right? So I, I've decided to try something a little different, all right? Eddie! Oh, yeah. This could be your future. Take a look at this. Positive, yeah. reinforce. <laughs> Spot a gallon low there, Eddie. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's hot down here, sir. It's probably evaporation. I'm sorry, where was I? Now, you, you were formally trained in acting. <laughs> yes, I was. Where? 
at, at, at Juilliard. At, yes. And did you ever envision this kind of work at Juilliard? No. This, this is, but as a friend of mine <laughs> likes to say, says you finally found a home for your style of acting on the Cartoon Network, which is where uh, that Adult Swim airs. Um, no, but this is, I call that acting sorbet. As a guy that has spent <laughs> 30 years playing cops and robbers and firemen and lawyers and doctors, this, this cleans the palate. I absolutely get to just be in silly and we do a ton of improv. And uh, it, it's just, we shoot for about um, two months every year, which is just a blast. You knew you wanted to go into acting when? I still haven't figured it out. I'm, I'm, I, I'm always in awe of people say, oh, I knew at five, or I knew at 12. I mean, I was uh, a typical kid growing up. In, I was born in Jersey, ra you know, raised here for a while. We moved to Detroit when I was very young. And uh, I was a Midwestern kid, liked sports. Um, you know, I went to an all-boys Catholic prep school, and the only way to meet girls, the only thing we did that was co-ed was theater. So uh, they happened to do the only play I knew, which was West Side Story, and uh, freshman year, and I got cast. So I did musical theater all through high school, and still was like, a lot of fun, having fun, great. I think I, I actually wanted to be a journalist. I was gonna like go study journalism, mm -hmm. political science, and uh, theater teacher said, I bet I can get you a scholarship to the local college. And I was like, and he did. So we, I started at Wayne State in Detroit, and again, was just sort of studying and thinking, maybe I'll go into English, I'll teach. Um, but then I went to England. I got, I was in a car accident. I, I, clearly I'm accidentally, I'm clearly. prone to, um, and I got some money in a settlement and used it to study a, a semester in England. And that's when I fell in love with acting. I've been working ever since. Yeah. You, you work a lot. I do. I always say, you know, I get called uh, the hardest working actor in New York. And I think it's, I, I think what they're saying is that I have to work really hard to be no, a good actor. No, it means that you're versatile and can do a lot okay, of things. You thank know what you, Steve. Stop. Thank you. Can, um, can we do the Sopranos? Yeah, let's talk about it. Gandolfini. Yeah. What was it like? Um... Yeah, I've been thinking about Jimmy a lot. I mean, because obviously with the 20th anniversary is happening right now um, of the airing of the show. And, uh, um, and I know his son, Michael, and I'm, I'm very excited about what's happening with the, the movie, film. the film. That and Michael's in it. Yeah, playing his dad, playing his father in flashbacks. Just in incredible. It gives me chills talking about it. But um, Jimmy was exactly what um, everyone, so often in my business, what people, people's perception or what they think of people is never you know, what, what they actually are like. Um, but Jimmy just had a reputation as a big teddy bear, nicest guy in the business, and that is all true. Um, sort of was the, the patriarch of the show, took care of people, did things, many things that most of us never talk about because Jimmy asked us not to, just things he did financially, things he did charity, things he did, you know, he was just a giver and, and, a, and a, uh, somebody who, who loved his role as, you know, the patriarch, but also hated um, publicity never did talk shows. Right. Um, you know, he did not like the spotlight. And I don't think I've ever worked with somebody who became a bit of a rock star uh, who hated it. I mean, first the year. Fame? Yeah, the first year or two when we would go the work out. He loved. The oh, art he, he loved. loved the work. Jimmy, Jimmy loved, loved, loved working, you know, and, and con loved to constantly have something on the burner. But uh, the first year or two when the show was on, we could go out in the city and have a good time and people would leave Jimmy alone. But then by season three, we were, I, I, you'd go out with The Sopranos, you were out with Led Zeppelin 1969, you're out with rock stars. You and know? we had Michael Imperioli on in our, um, our Tish WNET studio, check that interview out. He was part of a very, you were all part of a very special cast. It felt like a family kind of thing. Am I overestimating that? No, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you know, I, I know, again, like, you know, when you're trafficking those cliches from the business, but, yeah, I mean, it really was like a family, and we hung out a lot together whenever somebody would get, you know, whacked off the show. We would have a, a, a wake. We'd go to Little Italy and drink wine and say goodbye to them, and, you know. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a show that still kind of pulls on all my, you know, all the emotions, and yeah. I'm still in touch with a lot of the guys from the show. Real quick, uh, yeah. so Homeland... Yeah. Set that up real quick, 30 seconds. Uh, Homeland, uh, I got to spend a uh, season seven with Manny Patankin and, you know, be in his shadow and be in his aura. I just was such a huge fan of the show. Uh, it was a real treat to work with him, uh, another fellow Juilliard alum, and uh, uh, just kind of, you know, uh, learn from him and watch, the, watch his process. And uh, so that was a blast. And now they're finishing up with season eight, just about done with the show. Let's go to the clip. Who was that? O'Keefe, we're arranging to move the kid to a hospital. No, not until I get my man back. The kid's bleeding out. Your man shot him. Raised a weapon. 16-year-old, they shot him. 
Do not fuck with me on this. You will not like where it ends up. Respectfully, you have no chain of command here. Take it up with the director. So strong. Just a few seconds. Really strong. It's tough. You gotta, when you got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> that's tough. Good stuff. By the way, you want to take back anything you said earlier in the show about me? Uh, no, actually. They're, they're, I'll put more online for anybody that wants by? to watch. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. By the way, stay, stay, watch the curveball, watch the fastball. Yeah. Okay? Let's watch out. All right? Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. One of the best uh, communicators and coaches in the field you ever find, Patricia Stark, is a good friend. She's an author, uh, communication expert, and professional development coach and trainer. Good to see you, my friend. Great to see you, Steve, <clears throat> as always. You and I have been talking about communication for a long time. Yes. And we also worked together at another network at a different time yes, in our lives. Yes, we did. Um, when did you become fascinated by how we communicate, how we don't communicate, and how you feel you, how you knew you were able to help well, I think being a reformed, shy person um, from a very young age, which because of what I do for a living, people don't usually believe that, but it is true. And knowing how nerve-wracking and disabling it can be to not be able to communicate confidently and trust yourself. You said disabling. Yeah, Did you it mean really to say is. That? Yeah, it, it makes you feel frozen and not able to achieve and accomplish a lot of goals, a lot of things in your life, including relationships, your career, your future, so many things. And when I was working in broadcasting and then started transitioning to doing my coaching and training, I found that the underlying thread that runs through all of the things that I was helping people uh, do through trying to coach them through public speaking or media training or interview skills was that you need to find this thread of calm confidence. And that's how I came up with the term confidence, which helped me to write my book. And I weave that into all of my, my training now, because the way that we communicate internally, the story we tell ourselves, completely affects our ability to communicate outwardly to others. You know, sometimes I think there's this group of us who are obsessed by communication, who sometimes get so close to it because we do it for a living and we, we don't appreciate the anxiety, the, the fear, uh, all the other insecurities and things that go along with it, but they're very real. Yes. And here's the thing I'm curious about. You and I were just talking before we got in the air, and, and in my coaching, I, I do a lot of coaching in the field, and Patricia and I have consulted in other situations and talked about certain clients and shared our approaches. I'll say to someone, come in with a three-minute presentation on something that really matters to you. It's a corporate situation, whatever it is, institutional higher learning, whatever it is. They'll come in with a speech, and they'll read the speech. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, no, just tell me why this is so important. Right. No, no, I need my speech. And then when I take it away, they'll say, quote, I'm uncomfortable. Yes. And without belaboring them, I'll just say, your job is to get comfortable being uncomfortable, exactly. you say? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's simply because no one has ever shown them a better way. We're used to thinking, I got to write out my speech and I got to deliver my speech. Where Don't we learn that in school sometimes? We, we do learn that in school. And it's incorrect because what we really need to be doing is having a human conversation with other human beings. Devil's advocate. Someone <laughs> says, Steve, you don't understand. It's a speech. It's a formal speech. It's not that. Yeah. And we say. I say it should not be a formal speech. It should be a human conversation. Always. I don't care what you're talking about. People don't want to be spoken at and Lectured spewed information to. out. Right. There's only two ways to give people information. You can either push it out at them or pull them in with stories and pull them in with being human and being relatable. Engage, and engage you, them. You can't do that if you're just reading words off of your page. You know, it's interesting. I've watched a video of your work in, in the studio you work in when you're coaching people. You really do get people out there outside their comfort zone and doing it. And I'm a big believer, do it and do it again. And all of a sudden, like your son plays baseball, our sons play baseball. I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. Get up at bat a few times. Right. You still may be nervous, but what? Yes. Well, a good psychologist friend of mine told me, just because you're nervous doesn't mean you're not going to do a good job. 
And that, I thought, was brilliant because everybody thinks I shouldn't be nervous if I'm prepared. <laughs> if I'm really good at what I do, I shouldn't be nervous. No, being nervous means that you care. It means that everything is ready to be firing on all eight. You are where you need to be. Think of launching a rocket ship. Everything that has to happen, right. combustion-wise, explode. You know, I bet you some people are nervous yes. out of NASA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, hopefully they are. Right. But I, I tell people, just be courageous for 20 seconds because if you get out there, usually in the first 30 seconds to a minute, you know, everything starts to kind of settle and you find your footing. Because in the beginning, it can feel like an out-of-body experience. Mm. But do what you can to desensitize yourself to the situation. Uh, feel the fear and do it anyway, as there's a famous book that says that. That's right. But you, if, the more you avoid, the worse it gets. And then procrastination is the biggest confidence killer that's out there. Yeah. Try this, because we're also going to use this interview on a podcast and radio show we do called The Leadership Hour. Um, the connection between being a great leader and having to be a really solid communicator is? I think that, and I know we've talked about this in another interview, the best communicators are the best listeners. And a leader really listens and really wants open lines of communication, and they want it to be a two-way street, or open door policies we've heard of, from, uh, really the best. So you can't be a good leader without being a good communicator. Push back. Someone says, oh, you mean someone being a great public speaker? No. No. I, I think, first of all, unless you're just talking to yourself <laughs> in private, everybody is a public speaker. But we just put this um, thing on it from hearing about people having public speaking fear. And maybe I call it um, a fear, it's like a, a side effect fear of maybe you were speaking one time when you were going through puberty. Maybe it was at the uh, funeral of a loved one. Maybe something was just happening in your life where you broke up with somebody or got divorced or whatever, and now you have to speak and, and? it goes badly. By the way, stay now right you there. associate it with speaking. Sorry for interrupting while we're talking about yeah, listening. Yeah, sure. Um, I remember I had a client one time who was very afraid, 50-year-old guy, wanted to be president of a bank, freaking out and I ended up speaking. And I said, but you, you're one of the top people in your field. Why is it? And I'm talking to him privately and he said, Steve, when I was 14, I was running for student body president or class president. I had these index cards. I dropped the cards. And when they dropped them on the floor, I had to pick them up and everyone was laughing. And he's carrying that around like luggage. He's 52 <laughs> years old. He was 14 years old and he can't, he you, can't let you it hear go. that all the time. Absolutely. He can't let it go. I've had psychologists uh, that I've consulted with because I'm not one and I want to guide a client well, tell me that they've literally had to go through some kind of a, uh, like a hypnosis with clients to get them to say goodbye to that childhood person in them. To say goodbye to that little girl or little boy that had that experience in your mind and physically let it go. But you also help them do that. Real quick, before I let you go, a couple ways to get more calm and confident at the same time. Uh, well, there's so many, Give but uh, one thing is to picture your mind like a shaken snow globe. We're all juggling 8 million things, and we feel like we're not walking around with clarity. Just for 30 seconds at the water cooler or, or behind the closed door, watch your mind settle to where you can see all of that settle and then walk into a situation with a clear mind. Deep breathing exercises, we hear that, but it's not in when someone says, you're nervous, take a deep breath. It's in the release of that. Mm -hmm. Breathe and then whoo, let it all out. There's so many things in my book of the same name, Confidence, that um, will be published soon uh, that are all kind of exercises to help you get clarity, calm of body, mind, and spirit. The list goes on. Every time uh, our friend Patricia Stark joins us, I learn something new about communication and leadership and everything connected to that as well. I hope you did as well. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Well done. Stay Always right a there. pleasure. This is One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. I'll be right back. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. The doctor's in the house. She is Dr. Stephanie Sitnik, assistant psychology professor, Department of Psychology and Counseling, Colville University. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I'm fascinated by this whole question that you've been researching, talk about, and teach and help people on. It has to do with screen time. Mm -hmm. Screen time and our young children. We happen to have three, two teenagers and an eight-year-old. And I'm thinking, we're having dinner. What are you doing? And they think they can have the conversation and still be on the screen. Right. How do we give some tangible, practical advice for us, those of us who are parents who are frustrated? Well, I'd say the first thing that maybe to think about is what are you modeling for your kids? 
right? Hold um, on, we're talking about them, not us. I know, I know, <laughs> but they learn from from us, right? Um, and it's hard, right? It, it, there's, it's right there. You're so accessible. You have it's to right just, there. yeah, it's, it's always right there. Um, but I think limit setting is really important, Define right? That. We, um, saying, okay, you have a certain amount of time that you're, you can have access to a screen or, or within the sort of restrictions, right? Dinner time maybe is a, a no screen zone for the family. I mean, I, you have to do what works best for each family, but uh, certainly with um, limit setting is important, but then parents have to follow those limits. Too, we can't just right? say it. Right, exactly. We have to do it mm -hmm. and model it. Exactly. What, what are they, are, who put out some new guidelines on this recently? American Association of Pediatrics put, uh, just released some new guidelines. They had uh, older guidelines that I think they began to realize with the increased access of phones and tablets and computers and uh, that they just weren't very practical. So they, they've adapted those guidelines a little bit to be a little more flexible and, and to kind of incorporate the fact that what every child and family needs might be a little bit different. Doctor, how do we make this whole question of screen time and the technology right in front of us, what are some of the good positive things about it for younger people and then where does the line cross when we go, hey, this is not good? There are so many great things about it, right? I mean, there's, there, we, even for adults, we, the, the world is open to us now, right? All of kind of the knowledge and we have access to, to things and knowledge and people that we never had before. Um, for younger children, there's a lot of educational programs, there's a lot of educational television shows and apps and things like that that can really be quite helpful, right? They're, they're great. Um, I think the line is more when we have too much use or dependence on use. Or also what they're using it for. Right, or exactly using it for what research, they're using it. To get information, to, right. to, to tap into something you otherwise wouldn't be aware of, be exposed to. That's one thing. But the constant game playing over and over right. again, I ask myself sometimes, do our kids even know? Or, listen, I, I'll, I'll cop to this. There's sometimes I go on Facebook and I'll think, I gotta get all, I gotta get out of here. Just lost a half hour, yeah. I literally <laughs> have to get out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, and much less if I'm posting something, and then I go, so and so hates me for saying that. Well, why do they hate me? Let me find <laughs> out. What am I doing? I don't even know these people. Right. It's a rabbit much hole. Much less right? Twitter. Yeah. yeah. De to find the rabbit hole. Oh, I mean, I, th I think we all have experienced this, right? When you sort of think, oh, I'm just gonna go on for a minute or two, I'll just check my email, or I'll just, I'll just go on to Facebook or Twitter, and then all of a sudden, a half hour, 45 minutes later, you think, oh, that, that's not what I planned. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I think that happens to all of us to some extent, right? When you are, in fact, practicing what you practice, teach what you teach, mm -hmm. but to what degree, being as young as you are, have you been influenced by the technology? Because um, tw someone 20 years older than you plus in your field, he or right. she may not approach this the same way, but you're pretty close to this. Well, I, I don't know if I'm, well, thank you. I don't know if I'm as close as, <laughs> as But I, you're relatively um, close. I mean, I, I, when I first went to college, when I was first an undergrad, that was really when you could, I first ever, the internet was kind of starting when we first had email and things like that. And when we did research, we still had to go to the library and still go get the paper book, right. you know? Um, so it's been really exciting being in an academic field that I have access to all of that knowledge, right? right? But I think adults as well as children really have to learn how to be discriminating, right? It, is this a trustworthy source? Is this not a trustworthy source? With my own children, we really try to keep a close watch on what they're consuming. How do you do that? Well, I have a, so I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old. Uh, with my older son, we really set time limits and we kind of monitor maybe if he wants to play video games or watch television shows or things like that. We, we kind of watch what he's doing. We use parental co controls on the computer, things like that. Um, with my youngest, we make sure to watch with him so that we can discuss things. Uh, you know, maybe. You gotta be on this. You've gotta be all over. Oh, absolutely, it. and it, it's changing. I mean, I have no doubt that in a few years that my, my oldest son will far supersede me in terms of his technolo technological skills, so right? Then, sorry for interrupting, the time we have left. Uh, no. Older children, um, we have sons who go on the internet and they'll say, Dad, I read such, such and such in the news. I go, really, you read that in the news? I don't know what that's coming from, and I have to ask where it is, and I think that's a source 
that's not only biased, but they're set up Absolutely. to be biased. Mm -hmm. They admit they're biased. And our kids can't tell the difference sometimes between that and right. some objective information source. Mm -hmm. What about that whole piece of it? Some of us adults can't either. That's right? right. I mean, I think that that's something that the sooner we start teaching uh, children to be critical is really important that we do that as, as quickly as possible, right? That where is this coming from? Why might they want us to have a particular slant or not? So that they can start to make those kind of decisions, right? Is this right. a trustworthy source or not? A few seconds left. Um, children with special needs? Yes. What do you want to say here as it relates to screen time? Technology has been really great in terms of some of the apps available, um, communication apps that can increase that, uh, access to just ways to talk with other people, certainly. But I think we, uh, we also have to limit in that regard, too, right? Is the, is the child emotionally able to sort of handle different material, things like that, that we just have to keep a close eye on? Dr. Stephanie Sitnik, who is assistant psychology professor, Department of Psychology and Counseling at Caldwell University, uh, one of our longtime higher ed partners, uh, which I want to disclose, I, I recently taught a leadership seminar for a group of doctoral students in the field of education, some very fine students. Um, I want to thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Thank you for having well me. Done. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Atlantic Health System, NJM Insurance Group, Summit Medical Group, New Jersey Resources, PNC Bank, and by Suez. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.